Yep, 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 yep. Almost? Yeah, yay. So welcome everybody, thank you for joining. Thank you for choosing us instead of beer outside. So welcome to our session on security as code. Um, we started this subject, both Geert and I, because we both worked like half a year ago or something, we both worked at a bigger enterprise and we walked into all kinds of stuff. Uh, we do implement DevOps, continuous delivery, pipelines, all that stuff. One of the assignments that we both got simultaneously, more or less, was go and implement us a secure pipeline. So, well, that is a uh, tough question because what is secure? That is always the first question that we ask because we are consultants. So we went to the security officers in, in place and they talked to us and they said, well, we have this list of security rules or actually compliance rules or they mixed and matched uh, both. And uh, we got a set of uh, maybe 500, 400 rules defining what things need to, to needed to be done in terms to make, in order to make the system a bit more secure. So if you look at those things, which are actual abstracts out of that list, um, that doesn't make true sense if you're implementing a pipeline or any other imp uh, application that you're actually going to implement. Um, and that was actually quite hard. So I studied the list, um, and after a while, I got a bit sad, a tear literally spreading along my face. And after studying it for a full day, I got actually panicked. And I didn't actually know what I needed to do with that big list of rules that didn't make any sense to me in terms of what I was actually doing. So I went to Geert, uh, trying for, seeking for some comfort. And uh, Geert took over. Yeah, so um, I was at a different customer than Rene, but I was in the same situation. Uh, again, an enterprise with, well, almost the same list, of course, different items in there, but the same problem. And, well, we were on the phone and our reaction was, no, we're, we're not going to do this list. That's never going to work in an agile or DevOps space. That, that's, that will always slow you down, always be the bottleneck in your process. So. Well, we had this discussion, and the discussion kept on going, and, and the longer we kept on discussing, well, the, the harder our, no, we're not going to do this anymore, uh, we came. So, well, as consultants, we started working on how can we, how can we solve this. If you look at these, these rules, these, these big Excel sheets or, or list of things, they're, well, it's so many of them, it's really hard to understand what all of them mean. Um, and after you understand, you actually have to implement them. And if you manage to do that, then you, well, then you're compliant, of course, but how are you going to validate that you, that you really did all those things that were on the list? And what happens one month later? What happens after uh, what you've ticked all the boxes? What, uh, you keep on developing, you keep on adding stuff. How do you maintain all these rules? Hey, do you go over the Excel sheet of, of 30 pages every two weeks? How, do you, how can we do this? It's, it's really impossible. Uh, what you see is in organizations that, that use these kinds of, of, of sheets is that, well, initially, uh, you're really fully compliant. But uh, the more and more you keep adding stuff, um, uh, uh, yeah, you, you forget about some rules. And yeah, you see that. Um, that quality or security will go down a bit. Uh, and in typical enterprises or banks and, and those kind of companies, you have regular audits. So of course, when an audit comes up, uh, we'll give, look at the checklist again, see if we check all the boxes, and boom, we fix everything, and our security is at, or our compliance is at 100% again. And then as time continues, uh, we repeat this process. Um, and humans, tend to well, fill in these, these forms and say they, they check all the boxes, but well, sometimes humans make, make mistakes or they t to forget some stuff or, well, and they sometimes just lie to make things better and they can actually go to production. So we think this is not the right approach. So 
Yeah, we started uh, at, at both at different customers. We started our battle with security officers. Are there any security officers here in, in the room? Huh? <laughs> One? <laughs> okay. Welcome. <laughs> oh, two. Yeah. Um, so we started this battle and we said, we have to come up with a different solution uh, to this. Um, why do we need all these, all these rules? Or why, why do you have to uh, make us fill in all these lists? Isn't there any other way? Well, and basically when you uh, keep hammering on them, why do we need this? They, they say, yeah, well, we, we're not in control either, right? We have uh, risk and compliance and we have all these rules that we have to comply to. So yeah, you're out of luck. This is the only way we can do this. Um, but if you look at all these rules and specifics, yeah, we, we, this was our reaction on, on all these things, right? Um, yeah. yeah, but after a while, uh, we, we got on the phone again and um, we tried to, let, let's take a step back and let's have a, uh, let's really think about how we can do this differently. And let's go back to, back to the why. Why are we um, implementing all these rules? And what's the, the real reasoning behind all these rules? And if you look at, back at all those compliancy things that were on the previous sheet, all the, the different lists, they don't tell you how to implement certain stuff. They only implement, uh, they only say why you should certain, uh, do certain things. And they all come back to three different uh, things. One, says, one is uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. All of, all of the different security rules all come back to these three, uh, three areas. It's called the CIA triad or IAC or BIF in, in Dutch, different if you Google it. CIA is always hard to Google, get different results. Um, but it basically comes down to, to these three areas. Eh? Availability, eh? thinking about uh, your SLAs, the uptime of your application, um, eh? making sure that, that things don't go uh, down and, and your customers can always reach, uh, reach your data. Uh, integrity is more about um, are we sure that the stuff we put in production uh, was the stuff we are meant to put in production or is it possible to people, for people to alter stuff along the way? And that's why we do uh, automation, that's why we have automated pipelines. And the third one, confidentiality, is about how can we prevent um, well, people that should not access certain stuff to, to access it. So if you, uh, really, that's boiling it down to the basics and we want to um, come up with a solution that, that points at these three things instead of those compliancy lists. And if you look at compliancy, it's merely uh, checking all the boxes and, and it's not about security. If you're compliant, it doesn't mean that you're secure. If you're secure, you're probably also compliant. So we really think we should try to inverse this. And same if you uh, like this quote from the World Health Organization, if you don't have any symptoms of sickness, does that mean you're really healthy? I don't think so, right? It's not, um, if you don't have any symptoms of sickness, it, it merely proves that, well, that you don't know that you're sick. But you could, uh, you could be sick. And that could, um, maybe in a, in a month time or in a, after a while, could, could become visible because then only the symptoms will, will show you. If you've if you're never, never been hacked, um, well, are you that secure that you can't be hacked? I, I don't think so. And when we look at, at history, we, we tried to build really big walls. We thought that was secure. Uh, well, we made machines that were indestructible. Um, yeah, we, we add things like police and security guards that, that check everything you do. Um, well, that seems very, very good, right? Um, but after a while, we, uh, people think, think outside of the box and come up with new solutions that, yeah, that your high wall is a nice idea, but if we have uh, uh, slingshots that yeah, how, do you, how does your wall cope with that? Um, 
police and, and security guards also, uh, also human, can also make mistakes. Um, yeah, uncertain events occur to indestructible machines. Uh, and also things can come from the inside. Uh, um, poisoning uh, your king can, what, what happens when they're inside your company? How, do, how does your role uh, protect against that? So the solution or the, the mindset that René and I want to, uh, to see change in a lot of companies is move away from compliance checking and go to security engineering. So moving away from this check in time that we check for our known uh, security vulnerabilities and move into a direction that um, we make systems that are secure by default and um, are adaptable to change. So when new, new security issues come up, we're uh, able to adapt to cover those as well. So I think that we concluded uh, that security in the way that it is performed right now at the end of many things that have been uh, done is the next silo to fall. Because if we are going to a world where we do continuous delivery and we de deploy twice a month or 20 times a day, or it doesn't really matter, but more than once a year or twice a year, then the way that we do security checking is not a sustainable way. We need to do it in a continuous fashion, just like all the other things. So testing, we have shifted that towards the teams because we needed to test it more often. The requirements are moved into the scrum teams because we had to do more agile requirements. And the operations guys are also moving into the teams because we have to have flexible infrastructure. So security is the next silo that we have to, uh, that we have to follow. And for that, we need a mindset shift. And the former director of NSA had a, nice, uh, had a nice quote. He said, we need to shift from preventing breach to assuming breach and all kinds of other stuff. If you're not hacked, then pro pro probably you just don't know. Um, and that mindset shift, uh, whether it's true or not, I think that it's very important to, to understand that preventing breach is just building that big wall. But assuming breach is that building that big wall, but also make sure that you're secure that when that wall is breached with the catapult or from, from within the inside or a Trojan horse that comes in, that you're also resilient that you can recover from it. So to take a good look on what actually is the parameter of what we need to secure, I think that we can have three categories. First category is infrastructure, and that's closest to the things that we already know. So we have to secure our servers, we need to build firewalls, we have to do VNet protection, IP, IP protection, port scanning, whatever, everything on the, on the infrastructure side, authorization, user access management, all that stuff. That is, that is what people actually know and do. Uh, the IT pro teams are very good at it. They are building big, big walls, uh, but they are also very big so that you cannot actually function. But there is another uh, category, and that's applications. You also need to secure your applications because your applications also can have security leaks. Uh, libraries that we use, uh, think of Heartbleed or uh, the NPM uh, library that everybody used that was pulled off the open source uh, repos that the whole internet broke. There are a lot of things that you use that needs to be secure as well. You need to secure your passwords in a key vault or whatever. Your code needs to be secure. And that all boils down into the, also the delivery process because your infrastructure and your applications both need to move to the same, through the same pipeline. So the pipeline in terms of integrity also needs to be secure because if you have a secure application and you have a secure infrastructure, but the way how you deploy your application is not secure and the, the things that you are deploying are actually not the things that you think you are deploying, then you are also not in a good position. So all these things you need to secure. Um, in order to do that in this fast moving world, I think that moving uh, the manual things that we currently do, and this is the model that Geert already showed, that is not sustainable. We need to move from a manual approach to a code approach. Um, because in the manual approach we have these spikes and there is only one way where we can be in that top position and that will not be a flat line. 
uh, but that is code. We need to be in charge of our process, we need to have a repeatable process, and we need to do the things over and over again, and we need to do that uh, very often. The way how you can approach this is uh, maybe divided in three sections. You can do all kinds of things, but we can divide it into three things. You have to first be able to identify what, you, uh, what your risks are. So you need to make sure that you understand what can happen in your organization. Um, you also need to go into a prevention mode. So that is maybe closest by what we already do. You need to prevent bad things from happening. And you need to make sure that if bad things happen, that you can actually react on the bad things, that you can detect them, that you can respond to them, and that you can recover from them when, uh, when those things happen. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that. In the identify section, I think that working together with security is one of the main things that you need to, to, need to invest in. So instead of having security somewhere else in your organization and doing those audits once in a while, it would be great if they can be part of your scrum team. Maybe not full time, maybe only once, one, one day a week, or maybe spread out in different teams, but they need to be part of that application lifecycle process. They need to be maybe scanning your repo, maybe validating some pull requests that you do. They need to be part of the code because they cannot check things that they don't understand or don't know. So they can help you understand what needs to be done in terms of security, but they ca and you can help them in understanding what is actually being deployed on their, on their servers. So threat modeling, log files, make them log everything and make them accessible and useful. And also, you need to make sure that you understand what dependencies on vendors you have. And there are all kinds of code tools for that as well. Because if you look at code that is written nowadays, it's 20% your code, but it's maybe 80% code that is not your code. Code that has been used from open source libraries or Docker containers that you use. It's things that you didn't write yourself. And you just pull it from the internet and start using it. But how do you know it's secure? How do you know that that container doesn't c contain a vulnerability? Or, or how do you know that that open source library doesn't contain a vulnerability? Or maybe a, a library contains a GPL license uh, so that everything that you write is now suddenly open source because you didn't check the license. That's also security and you need to make sure that you understand it. And you need to have tools and code that can check that for you. So the second thing that we need to do is preventing stuff. So preventing stuff is not only building that big firewall that can be done with uh, Terraform or ARM or PowerShell or whatever you use to roll out your infrastructure. So you need to be able to roll out web application firewalls, VNet stuff, you can do that with code. But you also need to raise awareness because I heard a great example of, uh, of Microsoft. They had a uh, red team doing a phishing uh, phishing campaign within the organization. So they send out an email to all the employees. If you click this, you get the new brand new iPhone, blah, 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 with this installed, and everybody clicked it. But it was a phishing thing. So the red team was very happy because they gathered all kinds of passwords. Uh, all those things ne also need to be done. Um, analysis scanning, may make sure that you understand what you have. Um, Make security part of the teams. Make them part of your pull request review process and, and, and don't be a distant uh, foreigner of them. Um, yeah, we need some protection from, from ourselves. Make sure that you, you do all kinds of scanning also on the simple stuff like networks uh, and also passwords in the database, for example. Uh, passwords in, a, in, a, in, a, in the Git repos. Uh, if you search on, uh, on GitHub for passwords, you can find a lot of interesting stuff, uh, SSH keys and, uh, and such. Uh, if you do this at a random company, you'll find also a lot of interesting stuff. And maybe it's not the production passwords, but the test passwords can get you somewhere as well, uh, because that can maybe bring you later to some production servers. So Gauntlet is a tool that can actually scan your infrastructure, baseline it. So um, I have a test that assumes that this port is uh, always closed or always open. Uh, and you can have automated tests for that. So security tests on your infrastructure, it not only applies to your uh, application code, it also applies to your infrastructure code. 
and tools like credential scanning. Uh, this one is, uh, is, 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 a, is a Microsoft task. You also have uh, Talisman or uh, Git Secrets from Amazon. There are a lot of tools available in the marketplace that you can run during commit time or during uh, repo time uh, that, that can show you the code that is uh, not so nice in your uh, repository. Going back to the React phase, we have to divide them into three things. So first is the detect phase. You need to know what is inside your company. So you need to know how your infrastructure looks. So you need to monitor. Uh, and you need to monitor what's happening, but in order to, to, to look for anom uh, anomalies in your, in your system, you also need to know what is the normal state of your system. So you need to do a lot of baselining, and you need code for that. You need to know what is the normal running state of my, of my infrastructure landscape so that you can check if something changes. You can have some rules and some policies that some changes are nice and are allowed and some changes are not allowed and are flagged, like if someone adds an admin to a VM, mm, that's something that m might be a uh, possible breach, so we can check for that. So we can write all kinds of code and tests for that. Once you have detected it, you have need to respond for it. And I think the talk of... Um, um, Perpetual duty, um, that was a nice talk because that, that was about responding. So that incident commander, you need to be able to respond because the meantime to recovery is the main thing. If there is a breach, um, that then you can, all, you can have all kinds of discussions on, oh, how can this happen and uh, we should never let this happen again, blah, blah. But the only thing that matters is being up again and make sure that your, uh, that your breach is limited. So you need to have respond and for that continuous delivery becomes the enabler. So it's not the business enabler that everybody talks about, speed of delivery, but continuous delivery also brings you the fact that you can deploy a hotfix to your production systems without waiting three weeks. And then when you have uh, responded to it, you later you have to recover from it. So make sure that you have all your logs so that you can trace back uh, and then share your experience in postmortems and make sure that everything that you fix, maybe first manual, that it will be fixed later in code, be checked in code and add monitors to it. So for Azure, for example, uh, we work uh, with Azure a lot. Uh, for Azure, you have the secure DevOps toolkit, which checks your infrastructure for basic faults, like this, uh, this web app is not using HTTPS. This storage account does not encrypt at rest. This SQL server does not have threat protection switched on. All that basic checks that people may tend to forget, this toolkit can check it, and that brings your infrastructure in a secure state. And you can run it locally, you can run it in your pipelines, and you can run it on a schedule, so that you keep your infrastructure baselined and secure. Um, that is about your infrastructure, but we had some questions about how can we secure the role-based access? How can we secure the access management of certain stuff? And Geert can talk about that a bit. bit. Yeah, so I'll rather just show a demo. I'll show two quick quick demos because we only have a, a couple of minutes. Um, first demo I want to show is the, the security toolkit that René showed you. It's um, quite simple. It's, a, it's a, a set of PowerShell commands that you can just run on a, a certain subscription or a resource group. I'll show you what I created uh, as a resource group which is uh, this. So I, I just created a database and a storage, uh, storage account which with all the default settings. And when I run this script against it, which just comes out of the box, it will check all the features. It will say, well, uh, you have anonymous access to your uh, uh, storage container. You don't have HTTPS, all that kind of things. So in the end, it, this will output a, um, a comma-separated file. And you can use this in your logging, in your dashboards, to show up in, uh, in all your environments. Now we really uh, like to see um, developers have a, a playground where they can do all kinds of stuff, where they can work with the newest technology and, and have them experiment with it. But if you run these uh, controls on those playgrounds as well, you can inform them well, it's nice that you're playing with these tools, but they have security issues. So if you move these in a further stage, if you really want to get, uh, start using them and eventually want to bring them to production, please keep in mind that these are the issues that 
are currently in, in your state. So uh, you, you might want to look into, are you able to fix them? Or, uh, or you might want to search for an, another solution that, that is secure. So that's a really quick demo of the existing tools. Um, Rene was talking about the role-based access, and there wasn't anything for that on um, on Azure, and, and we work with Azure a lot, so we started working on our own library. Uh, we call it Azure Security as Code. And what this does is it um, it's also a set of PowerShell scripts that you can use for baselining um, your security settings or you can use it to continuously update your security settings. So uh, what you can do is um, we have all kinds of commands. So for example, looking into resource groups, what's the, the role-based access there, or your SQL, SQL databases, what kind of users do you have in your SQL databases. And what this does is when you run these commands, it will scan your environment and will save all the, um, all the RBAC settings as YAML files. So I can quickly um, run this command. So just give me all the resource groups and output them to a certain folder. Well, this will take a while because it's scanning, um, but I did this uh, beforehand when I was preparing. So in the end, you will see that the resource group that I, uh, I just showed you, and it, it has a lot of owners in there. So all these people are, are owners on the, Oh, and it actually updates because we, uh, we changed some stuff. But you see some, some people are, have owner permission, some people have reader permission. And of course, these, these files, we just we check them back into, um, into Git. So when I go to our central um, uh, Git repository, what I can do now is, okay, we have this baseline and it's stored in code. Uh, eventually, we could remove all the manual uh, permissions so people can't do manual changes anymore, and we only allow them to make changes through code. And when they change these YAML files, and I will, uh, I'll create a new branch. What I can do now is I'll, I'll just open this file, edit it, um, make some people reader. And I commit this code back to um, my Git repo. Um, I can create a pull request, so I actually have my four ICE principles on all the role-based access changes you do. Uh, you have an audit log of all the RBAC changes you do instead of, well, I'm the admin, I can set permissions. Now, a lot more people can set permissions, but we always have an audit trail of who changed it, uh, why did they change it, and uh, who approved it. So we create this pull request. Um, well, since I'm alone, I'm going to approve it myself. Uh, Rene doesn't have a, his laptop with him, so I'll just approve it. I'm fine, I'm fine. And um, now we have an automated build that will run. And this build will actually take a look at the YAML files, see if there's any differences with the, um, with the production environment, and will set uh, the permissions as they were supposed to compared to the code files. So uh, keeping this loop, we can always, always be in control of, uh, of our security. So since our time is uh, nearly up, well, we want to um, wrap up with this and uh, really look at, give you the solutions as well to um, try to be uh, compliant by default by baking in security in your processes. So the library Rene and I created for our solution for the, the role-based access on Azure is something we created and well, it didn't took us that much time, but if you run in those, into those kinds of problems yourself, you can also see in how can we change uh, our problems uh, from manual labor into um, well, maybe adding, uh, creating your own libraries that uh, take all the stuff into code and, and use those practices. So you have audit logs, uh, four ICE principles, and all those things uh, automatically. So we would like to wrap up with this. Uh, um, really shift from um, preventing breach to assuming breach. Um, 
embed security in your team, in your pipelines, um, uh, shifting left security, shortening the feedback, um, uh, all by automating everything and uh, trying to fix, find, and prevent uh, issues. So that's, uh, that's us. Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we have time for questions. There's room for, there's room for one question. Thank you. Anyone? <laughs> okay, so one question. We are uh, downloading those uh, YAML files. So can we document the changes over the period of time which uh, have been made to the security settings? Or can we get a report some sort of like, or maybe create alerts that this change was made, something like that, by uh, using the scripts? Now, I think the, the, the nice thing about the YAML files, it, it, they are just in the Git repo. So they are already documented, so all the history is there. You can see all the changes. And that's fine. I understand that the history is there, but uh, uh, I'm just saying that, is there a plan to automate uh, the alert, like the security has been changed on certain resource group or certain uh, mm. uh, storage account? You, you could do things like this. Um, I think the best approach is to actually remove the uh, manual uh, permissions to set permissions without these kinds of libraries. So you always, when you need I to understand. change it, you change it through code. Uh, but you, you can easily run these uh, scripts and compare them to, to the actual results and, and um, it, from, from there are like all kinds of APIs in the cloud that will, um, will fire on, on our back changes or those kinds okay. of things. Okay. Anyone else? That was the last one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.